witty, thought-provoking, and uplifting Southern Soul Livestream is a program that you'll invite your friends over to watch every week where you'll learn about interesting guests and get to share in their fascinating experiences. Tune in each Thursday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern to connect with guests from across the generations and to laugh with our eclectic hosts who are as charming as they are talented. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's our host, Calvin. Here at Southern Soul, everything we do is supported by donors, sponsors, and patrons like you. And we have what we call a cup of coffee campaign. And a cup of coffee campaign is essentially supports the creative work we do. Tamika's going to drop in the chat how you can be supported and a supporter of what we do, in addition to um, an opportunity for you guys to get access to certain workshops. We actually make our workshops actually no charge to our patrons, and also you can actually purchase the next workshop. Our next workshop is going to be this Saturday, and yes, I will be teaching a pod class workshop. It's going to be one hour, so if you've been thinking about podcasts and thinking about getting started, Tamika's going to drop it in the chat where you can uh, donate and purchase that workshop, and then join me on Saturday at 2 o'clock and essentially learn the foundation of developing your own theme and your own podcast. Next up, I have Dr. Sheldon Eakins, and I'm going to make sure I get that last name pronounced correctly. And we're going to get started, but I would like to say, what's up, my brother? How are you doing? Hey, listen, I can't complain. I can't complain at all. I'm feeling good. I, I, thank you for having me on the show, man. This is dope, man. I like the vibe. Well, well, thank you, man. Thank you, man. You know, it's it's so awesome, man. Like I tell people, it's not often I get so excited, you know, to, you know, connect with um, another person. I remember, you know, I was doing some reading. They said, oh, you know, when you do podcasts and you want to interview people and you want to kind of interview other podcasters. But I was like, I don't really know any, right? And I definitely don't know any brothers, right? So when I got an opportunity <laughs> and I found you, I was like, man, I got to meet this brother. And you know what I love, right? is that you were so warm, you were so inviting, you were like, man, I'm down, right? And even when the schedule shifted, right, you'd be like, brother, I'm down. I'm like, who is this brother? But when I talked to you more and more, it hit me. You told me you were from Texas. I said, that makes sense. Not only was the yeah. brother from Texas, but he started telling me some of his, and I ain't going to tell all the, the man's business, but he started telling me some of his favorite music. And all of a sudden, I say, that is is it. So I'm excited, man. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for doing your work. And, you know, just to get started, I would love for you to just kind of introduce yourself and let people know who you are and what you do. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that. I saw you struggling on the last name. I, it, it looks like Eakins. It, it does. It does. But it's actually Aikens. Aikens. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm Sheldon Aikens. Um, I mean, i I don't know. I'm a, I can get a little bougie sometimes. I got my doctorate, so I don't like to be called Mr. That's like the, the one thing that that's on my, like I used to tell my students, you can call me your highness, you can call me Dr. Akins. Um, but those are the two options that you have uh, for me. But, you know, I, I live in Idaho. Uh, originally, I'm from Houston, Texas. Uh, shout out to the SWAT. You know, representing Southwest A Leaf, Texas. That's where I grew up. Uh, and then somehow, somehow, my man, I, I ended up in Idaho. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't, it wasn't in my purview, but here we are representing 0.8% of black people in this entire state. Um, it's 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 you know, it's it's an interesting area. Been here six years. Uh, but my experience living in this state has really helped me with the work that I do. Uh, as far as like consulting and, and my podcast and things like that. So again, I'm very excited to be here. And um, listen, I don't get to talk to black people a lot. So just being able to, to chop it up with you for this thing live, you know, it's, it's already a pleasure and honor for me because I don't, I don't see black faces much. Well, you know, thank you. And I appreciate that. You know, you know, I often tell people because I'm out here in Atlanta, what I call this Wakanda, they call it, right? And I think oh yeah, so you're there. You're in the Mecca right there. Yeah, I think sometimes people take it for granted. They'd be like, well, is it the rest of the United States like this? You know, don't we have barbershops that are open on Sunday at 7 p.m.? Mm. I'm like, mm. oh, man, don't y'all know that's only right in certain spaces like Detroit, you know, Maryland, Virginia. But that is not the rest of the thing. I, so I think one thing that really makes you unique in the work that you do is the fact that you actually have you you're out in the what do you call it, the Midwest? I think that makes it very valuable for what you do. But I also 
when I step into your origin story, I know you spent some time in the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you don't mind, you know, tell us about your origin story, how you got stored and and how you went from Texas to the Virgin Islands to ending up in Idaho. And you may be frozen a little bit. Let me know if you can see us okay. I can see. Uh, ho- hopefully, you can see me. I don't know something wrong with my internet or something. I'm, I'm, I'm in rural Idaho, so it could be a thing that I, I could be having some internet issues. Um, but you know, you mentioned haircuts and barbershops. I, I want to touch on that for a second because, again, the black man living in Idaho, we all know, brother's hairline is uh, is sacred. You know, that's sacred sauce right there. And so, you know, I've I've had some experiences where you know, sitting down in a chair. I don't want to go to supercuts. I don't want to go to sports clips and those kind of plays. That's that's what's here. Uh, and so it was it was it's rough out here sometimes. Now, luckily, I do have my brother. My brother uh actually lives here. So that's the, that's that part of that 0.8 percent. Um, so my brother lives in town and he actually just got awarded uh best barber shop in southeast Idaho. So let me tell you what a blessing it is to have a black barber in a rural town that's killing it out there and i get the family discount so uh that's what's up i try to keep fresh every single week also not the super cuts yeah super cuts the thing out here man so uh, yeah i'm I'm, I'm fortunate but before he got here before he got here yeah it's you know sometimes i had to choose like do i want to go to the barber in town that's really good with doing lineups but terrible at haircutting or do i want to go to the other barber in town who's good at haircutting but it's going to push my line up back so it was one of those things where i had to kind of choose where i was going to be at like what, what kind of mood i want to be in do i want to just wear a hat all the time or do i want to actually rock the the nice hairline so luckily i don't have to worry about that anymore you know it, i appreciate that because you now just gave me the perfect illustration when i'm talking to my friends one on what i call this east coast right i'm telling you that they, they don't yeah. understand what the midwest is about but it's true and that's a great illustration that it can be hard to even find a decent barbershop when you're out Miss West. And they'd be like, well, why don't y'all do this? Why don't y'all do this? I'm like, come on, man, calm down. Don't y'all realize that the complexity of these things we live in? But, you know, tell us more about your origin story from Texas to Virgin Islands to Idaho. How in the world oh, yeah. did you get from the Virgin Islands to Idaho? Tell us about that, because I believe that is the foundation of your story. That- and I've been all over the place. I ain't gonna lie. I, I went to historic groups. So I grew up in Houston, Texas, um, and uh, went to school there, you know, A Leaf and all those things. And then I decided at some point that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and so I, I went to Oakwood University, a historically black college in Alabama, and spent my time there and learning the craft about teaching. And you know, honestly, yo, know, I, I had a pretty decent job. When I, by the time I graduated, I was working at a call center. I was a supervisor at that level and at the call center doing my thing. I was making decent money. I was actually making probably more money than I would have made as a teacher, first year teacher. And so honestly, I didn't look for work. I, I, I had my, my license, my teacher's license I was ready to go, but I didn't look all summer for any teaching jobs. And, and because I was pretty comfortable with the job I had. However, they decided to call me into the office one day and they told me, uh, Sheldon, we're getting rid of your department. Uh, so we need you to go back to the regular phones. We're, we're not going to, we're going to outsource your department to another call center. So it was like, dang, it's middle of August. And I'm like basically starting over and there's no teaching jobs available because all the jobs are gone. And I'm just, I remember sitting on the couch playing video games with my brother, playing Madden. And I'm like, bro, I don't, I don't want to go to school tomorrow. I mean, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. I just don't want to do it. It sucks. And I literally got a phone call like right away from a superintendent, he, he, he calls me, he says, this Sheldon Akins? I'm like, yeah, this is me. And he says, you know what? I'm a superintendent in the Virgin Islands. Would you like to come teach? We need a history teacher. I'm like, hell yeah. I'm like, I'm coming to the Virgin Islands. Like I'm about that life. So first, you know, I'm packing my stuff up. I'm overseas. I go to the Virgin Islands. And that was like, you know, it's, it's funny because I blend in, you know what I'm saying? I, I look like one of the locals until I start talking. And then they're like, yo, 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 you are a Yankee. And I'm like, no, I'm not a Yankee. You know, I'm actually from Texas. So I, they don't care about none of that stuff. To me, the, if you're from the States, everybody's a Yankee that's from the States. And so, um, but my experience there is like, okay, I went to school in college. I learned about teaching strategies. I went to historically black college. Yet when I went to the Virgin Islands, I did not know the culture. 
And that was like a quick thing that I had to learn because I really discovered in the beginning that I was like straight up rude to the people. Like I would walk into to rooms, I wouldn't say anything. Uh, people will say, hey, good morning to me. And I'll say, hey, what's up? How y'all doing? How you living? How you feeling? Like, what's good? Like, what it do? Like, that's that's how I would talk in the States. So when I would come to the, to the Virgin Islands and I would just speak, you know, how I would normally talk, it was very rude because it wasn't their customary practices. And I had, I was very fortunate that one of my teachers, he, he pulled me to the side. He's like, Sheldon, look, everybody thinks you're rude. I don't think you're gonna survive it if, if you don't change up your, your practices. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? I thought I was, you know, doing my thing. I'm just being myself, trying to be cool. And he was like, what do you say when someone says good morning to you? And I said, yo, what's up? How y'all doing? How you living? He's like, no. In our practices, in our culture, when someone says good morning to you, you say good morning back. Someone says good afternoon. Someone says good evening. Whatever time is time of day it is, you say it back to them. When you walk into a space, when you walk into a room, even if you go into the post office, just walking into the post office to mail your packages. If there's people in there, you say good morning or whatever time of day it is. That is what we do. And so that conversation that I had with this individual, like really opened my eyes because I'm like, I'm thinking I'm doing my best and I'm engulfed in the culture. However, I really wasn't. I was really still bringing my own stuff and I'm, I'm a visitor in someone's community and I didn't really understand those differences. And so that moment was, was kind of like set me on my journey to the kind of work that I do, which is making sure that whoever's in your classroom, whatever demographics there are there, uh, what community they serve, especially in our black communities, we need to make sure that the content that we're providing is relevant and relatable to them. Awesome. Awesome. I'm telling you why I love that story. I am probably talking almost every single day to a friend, an associate or something about culture, about culture dynamics. And I don't know what it is. You know, I think about us black and brown people. We assume that if you have brown skin, then obviously you're going to do what we do. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do what we do, we're going to force you to do what we do. And we're going to say, hey, you ain't black like me. You ain't black enough and all this other kind of stuff. But you happen to be a black man who stepped into another black and brown culture and felt like an outsider. And you began to appreciate culture by beginning to see how thin culture can be and how invisible it can be. I'm like, O-M-G. Like I said, for all my colleagues on this East Coast, they thinking of everybody. And if you ain't like them, they're like, oh, you ain't black. I'm like, come on, man. But what I love it is that that's not just an experience. You didn't stop there. You ended up in Idaho, right? And based on the topic of tonight is educating black boys in white spaces. I chose the topic black boys in white spaces, but we're talking about our kids, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that, you know, I began to share with you is my observation of my own son, who's a black boy in a white space. Mm. And it started simple. Hey, you know, we want to get the best education. We want to get the best schools and we want to put him in this school. And he ends up in this thing that parents have come to me and they say, Calvin, you got to do a show on what it's like when our children are the only ones. Mm. And you've had a lot of experience, not only when our children are the only ones in these white spaces, but some of your experience on the reservation in Idaho have allowed you to see a lot of kids who come in with IEPs. Oh, tell boy. us about your experiences and your work in Idaho. Give us that background and tell us what you've seen with black boys, black kids, kids of color, you know, in Idaho. You know, that's that's a very interesting question, because, again, I. Four years ago, four years ago, I, I just remember being in a space and I was working at the university and, and I worked for a program called TRIO. So, so folks who aren't familiar with TRIO, TRIO is a federally funded program. I work for Educational Talent Search. So basically what I did was I went to the high schools and some of the middle schools and I worked with the students and helped them, you know, learn about college, career op opportunities, fill out their fi financial aid, get scholarships, take them on college tours, the whole nine. And one of the challenges that I had was Again, predominantly white spaces, but there were people of color. Now, again, there are not a lot of black people out here, but there are indigenous people here. There are our Latinx folks are here as well. And so, like, I would have a lot of kids come up to me and tell me all these different issues that they were having. You know, Sheldon, this is, you know, I feel like my counselor's telling me, you know, some things just because of my skin color. I, I have my counselor saying, look, speak English only. This is America. Or I have... uh 
teachers telling me these things, or I have students, my classmates are telling me, go, when are you going back to Mexico? Or we're going to build that wall and all these different conversations. I did not know how to help them, Calvin. I, I, this was new to me. I, I'm, I'm struggling as it is as an adult. I'm dealing with my own microaggressions and, and dealing with stuff getting thrown at me, uh, stereotypes and all these things. And I'm like, how am I going to help my students? In addition to that, I got two black kids that are growing up in Idaho and I'm trying to figure out how do I support them as well. And so naturally, this I'm like, I don't know how I can do better. I don't know how I can support my 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 folks that I'm interacting with, let alone myself. And so that's how I started the podcast. The podcast just started because I was literally finding articles and I would reach out to the, the publisher, whoever did the research, and I would interview them and say, hey, I got questions. Can you answer these questions for me? And I just wanted to share this with everybody. Well, fast forward four years later, we have, you know, the show is where it's at. But in that time frame, I've had the opportunity of serving as the special education director for the reservation out here. So we have the Shoshone, and I, I should recognize, I should have started that off in the beginning, but I, I am speaking to you on the lands of the Shoshone and Bannock tribes. And so, I, you know, unfortunately, you got two tribes that are put on the reservation, um, but I'm working at the school. And what will happen is we see a lot of kids will come in from the, the, the school in town, the schools in town, and they would automatically have IEPs. Hmm. And, and when we're talking about 100 kids at the school, and I had 40 of them with IEPs and 504 plans, that's a high number. And as I get, get a chance to get to know the kids, and I'm like talking to them, just kind of getting their the actual story. I'm learning, look, man, you don't need to be in special ed. You, you don't have a, a learning disability. You just miss some school or, or you, you could just benefit from some tutoring. You don't have to be, you don't need to be in this program, but a lot of the kids are being misdiagnosed. And, and that's really unfortunate. Like how, you know, we talk about statistics a lot and we'll say, you know, you know, nationally, uh, students of color are, are disciplined harsher. Uh, or they're, you know, they're in I, IEP, you know, they're in special education represented higher, but they're not in our gifted and talented programs. We don't see the representation in our advanced courses and honors courses and things like that. And I have had these conversations where people say, well, not here. That's not our school or that's not our state. Oh, that, that's other. Those are more populated areas that are dealing with this. But I'm like, no, it does happen here in rural Idaho. Yes. Look at the data. Look, look, look at who's coming in. Why is it that whenever we have a new student, a new student that's going to transfer into our tribal school, we automatically ask them or assume that more than likely they're going to come in with an IEP? Something's wrong there. If that is the automatic thought, oh, I bet they probably let's bring Sheldon in. Uh, we need to make sure he's in this meeting because that, that person might have an IEP. So it's it's unfortunate that a lot of kids are being misdiagnosed. Uh, what I did in my program, especially with our school psychologists, and like when we would get referrals for students to get tested, my goal with that process was to really get an idea of as far as the student's story. Sometimes we just sit our kids down and test them and don't get any background information. Don't talk to the guardians. Don't talk to parents. Don't talk to siblings. Any like don't get that background story. Literally just sit them down, three hour test. Someone's going to write up something and, oh, this student has uh, a learning disability. But we didn't learn anything else about the kid. It's just stats and numbers and not anything human to really identify, does this child really need to be in a, do they need additional assistance? So when I worked with my, my school psychologist, I mean, he was awesome. He's a person of color um, and he would come out to the reservation and he would schedule meetings. We'll bring the parents or guardians in, we'll talk to them, get their background story, then do the testing and then spend some more time with the student, learn more about them. And then what he would do is he would look at the scores according to the other students' scores within the school. So the placement wasn't necessarily on a national level, right? Because we're going to see that there's going to be some discrepancies if we do it on a national scale. But if we do it on a local scale, then we can really see, okay, how does this student compare to the rest of the school members in this, in this environment? Because this is who they're going to be associating with. This is who they're interacting with. It makes more sense to do it that way. So unfortunately, Calvin, yeah, it's an issue. Um, don't have a lot of Black kids in, in the area, my son, um, I could tell you some stories about some of his interactions at school, but you know, that's just how it's, how it is. Oh, you know, I love that story, man. And it deserves an OMG moment. And I'll tell you why. 
is that we often have people who are professions, you know, ADHD doctors, and then you have people in the community be like, oh, that person's a doctor. We should automatically believe what they say and we should do this. And, and I've, I've discovered that sometimes people don't understand, parents don't understand what it means to advocate for your child. Mm -hmm. And I've seen in other places where they're like, well, the teacher or the principal, they're the authority and we got to, you know, believe what they say. I'm like, whoa, 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 it's complicated. Everything you just said for the people in the chat, they ought to be like clapping right now because what you just did is you broke it down. You said what was happening to our children, it was just numbers, numbers, numbers. Yeah. And they take a kid, they put them in there, they test them in his number. And what they've done is they stripped away that child's whole humanity. Mm -hmm. Stripped away his culture, his context, his humanity, his name, his family, and just put him in front of a computer and said, hey, good or bad. Like you said, they spent no time talking to the parents. No context, nothing. Nope. You know, even robots, even animals deserve, I'm, I'm going to slow down because I'm going to get a little excited. <laughs> but it's just, I love the fact that you came with not just numbers, but you came with a solution. And what was that solution? In case y'all didn't hear it. He says, you got to give context to these kids. Yeah. You got to talk to their parents. You got to understand their stories and their personalities. I love that. You know, I want to talk something else about culture before we shift, because I'm looking to learn about leading equity, your book. And, you know, I purchased that book and I read it. And I'm so excited. I'm going to tell you about, Appreciate what it. about it. But something else you said that really, really um, I got excited about microaggressions. Mm. Microaggression is such a compli thing, complicated thing. I go back to my business school every now and then. I start seeing microaggression. Mm -hmm. And I know how I look. You know, I'm the boho brainiac, right? I got this beard. I got this whatever. I got braids, whatever. You know, they ain't used to nobody looking like me showing up. Come on, brother. But, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I show in there and I step in there, you know, high kneels, high heels, you know, just, just how we do. You know, as cues. But at the same time, what yeah. hit me is they are not familiar with this. Well, I'm down in Mecca. I'm in Wakanda. That's how, you know, you know, we got flavor, personality, whatever. They're going to have to get used to it. But I'm not worried about that. Microaggressions. You said you were accustomed to certain things in Texas, but then you got the Idaho. Are you telling me that the microaggressions mm -hmm. of things you experienced in Texas was different from Idaho? Break that down. Let me tell you, let, let, let me tell you something, Calvin. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I grew up in Houston, Texas. I grew up knowing exactly. I mean, it's out there. It's blatant. Stars bars, easy to see, right? I knew, I knew, I grew up knowing exactly where not to go, what cities not to visit. If you break down in this town, you better keep on riding on them rims and and or try to push it through. Don't stop anywhere. You try to figure it out because you don't want to. You don't want to break down here. You don't want to get pulled over in this city. You don't want these issues. It's open. It's out there. It was very known. I totally have like I I prefer that actually. I I prefer to know. When you move to the northwest. Things get a little different. Things get a little hazier because people aren't as open and blatant with their thing. And honestly, in my experience, a lot of times, I honestly believe a lot of people had the best intentions. Uh, it's just, again, when you're in a space where there's not a lot of interaction with Black people, you, I'm talking about I, I might be the first or the fifth Black person they've had to interact with in their whole lifetime. You know, or, or they, they just remember growing up in high school and there was that one Black kid. That's all they had. So that's all they had to go off of. And so what happens is there's a lot of unintentional, subtle stuff that will happen to me. People make assumptions. I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost 40 years old, man. I'm 39. And I can't tell you how many times people ask, ask me if I play for the team. You know, if I'm on the college football team or the basketball team. And he's like, I'm 40 years old. Why? Do, I mean, I guess I age well. I mean, I guess I don't look so. I mean, should I take it as a compliment? I mean, I'm in the gym. Don't get me wrong. I'd rather be in there. But at the same time, my thing is this. I live in a college town and I auto automatically I'm, I'm always stereotyped. People always ask me, you know, are you are you the coach or are you on the team? These kind of things. And I always say, well, no, I'm not. But I'm, I'm curious how you didn't think I might be here on an academic scholarship. You know, Why did you automatically assume that I must be an athlete? based off of the stereotypes. And I, sometimes I like to challenge. I like to throw out little questions. It's just like what brought you here? What made you ask that question? And just kind of let them, you know, squirm a little bit to see see what they're going to say. Because when you when you uh, when you throw those questions out, like I'll give you another example. Last year, you know, it was Christmas time, and you know, outside the store, there's 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 a little Salvation Army, you know, dude ringing the bell and out there. And so I'm walking into the store. He's like, "Hey, man, where are you from?" And I'm like, "Yo, I live here in Idaho." He's like, "No, but where are you really from?" I'm like, "I live here in Idaho," and he's like, "Well, you don't look like." 
you're an Idahoan. And I said, well, what does an Idahoan look like? I don't have a sack of potatoes on my back. So you got to give me a little bit more than that. And so he was like, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, you just don't, you know, you just don't look. What does an Idahoan look like? What, what, what should I look like? And, and I like to see, like, I like to see them respond. Like, how are you going to respond? But then again, he's doing some charity work. You know, he's out there ringing the bell. I was like, you know what? Maybe I should leave him alone. But these type of situations happen to me a lot. The thing about microaggressions here, living in the Northwest, for me, in my experience, I get the same ones. And, and so because I get the same ones all the time, I typically have my go-to responses. And it depends on the time of day. It depends on how I'm feeling. You know, sometimes you just don't have the energy. Maybe it's the third time in the day or the third time this week. Someone said the exact same BS to you. And you're just like, you know what? I'm not in the mood. I'm just going to snap back one time and let it go. And then sometimes I'm in a more of a teachable moment. I'm like, you know what? Here, I know you didn't mean anything when you said this, but it was offensive. And here's why. And then I can take a little time to educate. So it just kind of depends on how I'm feeling and how many times I've had these experiences. But yeah, microaggressions is a thing. Now, uh, I'll say one more thing about microaggressions because nowadays I just say aggressions. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, the thing about the thing about uh, microaggressions is supposed to be like unintentional and, you know, yeah. best, best intentions type of thing. However, if I don't know you, I really don't know your heart. I don't know where you're at, mm-hmm. either, whether you got a smile on your face or not. I don't know if you're being serious or if you're being like, you legit made a mistake. I don't know. So nowadays it's just it's just aggression for me. You know, I, I like the way you describe it. And for the audience, if you if this one of those terms, you know, I remember when I was first introduced to the term microaggressions, I didn't like it. It didn't sound right. So no. I love the fact that you adjusted the term. You know, um, for some of my friends up top, up in New York, they call them, you know, down south um, passive aggressiveness, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, but the significance of microaggressions is passive aggressive behavior. Right. And I love the way you described it, depending on the time of day and how you feel is depending on how you deal with it. But it's real simple. It's like I experienced this when I'm at my own business school and I can imagine my son experience. I'm raising my hand and I'm on the front row. Now, how does speaker going to ignore me? And I'm on the front row and I'm raising my hand. Right. So mm-hmm. they're passive, but they're aggressive. And I like how you break it down aggressive. But one thing I love about aggression, as you say, is our children are experiencing these mm. aggression. These microaggressions, these passive aggressiveness, they're experiencing this from teachers and educators in the school. And we're going to talk about that a little bit um, later. But what I want to do is kind of transition to your book, right? Leading Equity. I love the book and I love your response, too, because in your book, you kind of talk about that. You talk about when people say stuff, how to challenge them and what questions to ask them. Right. Mm -hmm. When they say stuff that Mm -hmm. sounds like just kind of shallow, kind of stupid, kind of slow. Right. But that's a part of it. But as I was reading your book, I actually showed it to KD and she was excited, too, because she's like, oh, this is a good book. You know, and so she works with a lot of nonprofits. So she was like, I knew she was going to like your book. But tell us about your book for the people who hadn't had a chance to buy it. And Tamika is going to drop it in the chat so people who are curious can go out and buy it. Tell us about your book, Leading Equity, and why did you write it? Thank you. Um, yeah, Leading Equity. I don't know if you can see this. Becoming an Advocate for All Students just came out uh, back in July. Um, listen, here's the thing. I've been I've been running my show for about four years, and uh, I, I can tell you how many times people ask me for checklist. Uh, you know, t- white teachers will reach out to me and say, Sheldon, what is I need a list of strategies in order to reach my your my black and brown kids in my classroom. I don't I don't know how to relate. I'm I'm having a hard time, and I do not personally believe in checklist. Uh, I, I you go to the store. You say I'm gonna bake me some cookies. You go to the grocery store. You get you know you get your flour. You get your sugar. Whatever comes. With, I don't know how to make a cookie, but you you get all the ingredients and you make a cookie. You're done, right? I don't believe that the same thing applies for equity work. When you're saying that you want to connect with your students and you want to get those strategies, yeah, I can give you some support. I can give you a framework, but it's not a, a recipe for success, okay? Instead, it is a matter of, okay, what are some of these tools that I can in- implement today, maybe even tomorrow, and how can I build on creating those great relationships with students? And again, making sure that the work that I'm presenting and collaborating with with my students is relatable to them In addition to that, I need to also make sure that what I'm learning and the work that I'm doing isn't just for me, because what happens? Our our kids see multiple teachers and staff throughout the day. 
So if it's just my classroom, if it's just me that's doing the work that's trying to be culturally responsive, culturally relevant with my practices, and then they go see Miss Jones right after my the bell rings, uh, and Miss Jones is not on point, then again the child's experience is going to be determined on uh, the the level of the teacher's ability to again relate to the students. So the last piece is the advocacy work. So not only are you doing this work for yourself, but you're also teaching others, you're also having these conversations and engaging. So the book has 10 different um, things that we can do. Again, it's not a checklist. It's not, okay, you did these 10 things. I'm good to go. I'm certified. No, it's more of here's some things you might not have considered. I think it's important or it's relevant to teachers at all levels. You know, whether you're a first year teacher, you're just starting, or you've been in the game for 30 years. If you are in a position where you are working with students and you want them to, to thrive and you want to create those relationships, you want to just those foundational things and want to educate yourself and learn more um, about how to decolonize your classroom, how to uh, create those re relationships and uh, just simple things as, as far as just learning the students' names. Like these days, we got kids from different countries that have names that are quote unquote hard to pronounce. And... Teachers will just give them nicknames or Americanize their names and not give them the, the respect of taking the time to learn a name. Um, but at the same time, we expect them to learn names like Tchaikovsky and Beethoven and all these things. We can, we can say those words, but we can't seem to say uh, Juan, right? Like little stuff that people won't do. And it's, it's just really broken down into those concepts to, again, uh, allow a teacher or an educator, whoever's in the classroom with students to be able to like learn these skills. And again, it's not a checklist. It's just a process and a framework. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I'm glad that you um, published that book because now that I think about it, you're right. People, they want those civil bullets. They want something simple. You're like, yeah. no, 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 you know, and you know, <laughs> Me We're my, not baking a cookie, man. We're not baking a cookie. You, yeah. you, you, it's more than that. It, it's so much more. And, you know, my friends and I, we also talked about, you know, various people who can read the book. Like, as a parent, I'll tell you why I, I love, love the book. Is as a parent, you know, who have, I have a seven-year-old, and people are like, oh, Calvin, you naive. The system's been by whatever. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in the classroom, and I'm looking at it for the first time with these adult eyes, right? eyes that have lasers that can really see through stuff, right? So now I'm seeing it with adult eyes. I'm like, man, it's crazy out there, right? And if I try to talk to educators, they're just doing this CYI, political talk. They talk it in circles. I have no idea what they're talking about, right? So I was like, man, how can I have a real conversation with a real person? And that's why I appreciate you, by the way, and your book, because your book breaks it down. So I think your book is very valuable for parents also. I also know Thank about you. your book that you have some stories of your daughter in there and you're very proud mm -hmm. of your daughter because I love what you said. He's like, Calvin, she's getting microaggressions. And if I misquote, mm -hmm. just try to quote you, you're like, you know, if anybody want to kind of argue, you know, who's the most black or the less black or whatever black, just because my daughter's out here in Idaho, you know, t you know, do not misunderstand her black experience because she's seeing this stuff every day. Tell us about some of the stories or the nuances of you as a parent educator having a black daughter and watching your daughter experience these microaggressions. Look, look, my baby girl is militant as hell. Like I, she don't play. Like it's we're, we're talking about. So she knows what I do for a living, right? So she 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 stay coming home. Daddy, go to school and talk to my teacher. And I'm like, okay, I'll go. What happened today? You know, that that's kind of how things go. Um, she shared a story with me actually uh, last week. She she so they were in class there and they were talking about various religions around the world. And uh, there was a story about a gentleman that was in the airport taking pictures with a turban on. He had a turban on his head. And so there was a woman, a white woman that ran, saw this happening, went over to the police and brought the police over and you know said, you know, there's this guy I'm afraid. And he's he's taking pictures in the airport. The guy is minding his own business, by the way, right? And so the teacher in the classroom was sharing a story with his with the kids. And even I think even a boy even yelled out, you know, this one was being racist. But the message that was portrayed to the class was basically, oh, this woman was afraid. And so therefore she went and called the police. Now it turns out when the police show up to this man with the turban on, he was actually an undercover cop himself. And he's like, look, I'm doing some, some work right now. I'm an undercover cop. And, and so that's the reason why I'm taking these pictures. 
And so then I tell my daughter, I said, well, what do you think about that? Do you, do you agree? Do you feel like this lady was just afraid and she was just doing what she had to do because she was scared? And she's like, no, daddy. No, no, she wasn't afraid. She was being racist. I said, exactly. I said, if your teacher was at the airport taking pictures, I'm pretty sure the woman wouldn't have ran over there and called the police officer. It was because a man has on the turban. This woman was, quote unquote, afraid or or well just yeah well she was afraid because stereotypes right she thought he was some sort of terrorist obviously obviously so that's just look so so she said okay what should i do daddy so she's like i want to talk to my teacher about it and so the thing about like one of the joys i, I guess one of the biggest parts of being a parent is just being able to teach your kids strategies right because like again my daughter's navigate she's the only only black girl uh in her grade and it's that's been the case every single year and so she's always, we're, we're always going through a game plan. Okay, all right, so go to your teacher tomorrow, try to talk to her one-on-one, -on -one, let her know how you feel and tell her why you feel this way and see how she responds. And sure enough, my daughter went to school the next day, talked to her teacher, let her know how she felt. She's like, look, I think that this was more racism than her being afraid. And she gave all her points. She was ready to go. And the teacher listened to her. And guess what? That same day, the teacher addressed the class uh, and revisited that conversation and the story from the day before regarding the young man in the turban. So I, I, I try to let folks know that, that man, listen, our, our kids have a voice and if we can just empower them now, I rec recognize I got privilege with, you know, I, I know that lingo and I literally do consulting on DEI work all the time. So my daughter has an advantage, but just these kind of conversations with you, Calvin, I think are helpful for other parents who maybe they don't have the educational background and experience or the consulting experience, these kind of things. But as still being able to, how can I help my son? How can I help my daughter out when they're dealing with these issues? Because the reality is a lot of her teachers aren't comfortable with talking about race. They're not going to, you know, again, best intentions, but they're not going to be able to support her like, someone like myself can be at a supporter because again, I have these lived experiences and I recognize how to have these kind of conversations. And I, my goal is to instill that same information to both of my children. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that story. I mean, I, I love that story and I love the conversation. And, and I think your daughter, what she's about 12 years old, right? In that time frame. Yeah. She's 12. Yeah. yeah. yeah around that thing. It was like last week. This is last week, man. Like th these are things that we did. Like it's, and then I bet you next week it will be something else that I'll I'll end up coaching her through. It's it's very typical. My son is a little bit quieter, um, but my daughter, like I said, she's pretty militant and she she does not play. And so she's always coming home like, "Daddy, what can I say? What should I have said?" So I'm giving her I'm giving her tips on how to roast kids when kids start calling her hair crazy or saying stuff, you know, pulling on her hair and one touch her natural hair, all these things. All right, this is how you do it, baby girl. This is how you say it back. To, like, okay, tell me about the kid. Describe the kid for me. And so now I'm creating jokes and all these things so that she can stand up for herself, man, because it's wow. just her. Well, I love it, man. I love it. I love it. And I'm telling you why I love it. Because, you know, another question I have for you is, you know, the educational environment. And I think what you told me, and I like what you told me, you said, man, critical race theory has people scared so much so that you know educators teachers or whatever they may just be so afraid to say anything that if you're a parent and you expected some form of community some form of conversation you ain't getting it you get you know the politically correct answer but i don't know what's your observation of what's really going on in these streets i guess when it comes to teachers principals educators do you think they're just paralyzed by cya in a political climate what do you think's going on you know, it's, it's it's interesting because <laughs> I live in Idaho and and you know, we're like I think we were the first state to to ban critical race. Like we we love setting some trends. Like we 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 we've been passing some laws lately, and uh, it makes things difficult as an educator, right? Because sadly, I don't do a lot of work in this state, um, just because folks don't want to hear me. Um, oh, wow. and, and I can present it in, in in any kind of way. It's just the fact if you mention if you just say equity. It's going to cause a trigger. It, if you say critical race theory, any of these things, and the thing about it, no one really knows what it is unless you're actually a, a law professor or you, you know, this is some research that you do. We're not teaching this in school. It, it's, it's, teachers aren't doing this. But again, you hear a lot of rhetoric and it's almost like the candy man. You say it five times and, and then it shows up. Like that's how I feel about the word 
critical race theory. And so unfortunately it's been put under like, so equity used to be one thing, right? Equity was kind of like the umbrella and then you had all these different things on the equity, but people have tried to put critical race theory above equity and to say any word that has any sort of association with a diversity, equity, inclusion theme, that is critical race theory and it's a bad thing and your kids are being indoctrinated, your kids are being taught to hate America. And so it does make it challenging. I thought it was kind of ironic that we passed a law to make Juneteenth the, the, a, a national holiday, but then we can't even talk about it in class and let our kids know why to get out of school because of critical race theory. And so like these type of things where it just doesn't really make any sense I just think it's just a, uh, a way to try to uphold white supremacy. And if you're in a legislative position where you can actually, um, you know, pass laws to say, you know what, you can't read this book. Yeah, and you can only read the books that I want you to read. Where's the indoctrination there? Like, we don't mention that. So you're literally passing laws saying that I can, you can only read the books I think you could read, that I approve of. That's indoctrination to me as opposed to allowing students to be able to, to really investigate and choose the books they want to choose on their own and learn about maybe their own identities, learn about conversations or things that they're not being taught at home, but being able to have some self-discovery and be able to have some critical thinking skills created. Like, but again, I digress, man. You, you're going to have me, uh, you're going to have me preaching up here, Calvin. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep myself calm, man. I love it. I love it. One of the parents who actually requested this show, Jennifer, is in the chat, and she is excited because I'm pretty sure I'm going to put her on microphone later on. So, Jennifer, get ready. You know, if you're not in your car, you can get on the microphone because I know you would love to talk about this. A few last questions. We're going to do open forum, and I don't think the second speaker popped in. This is the first time we had a speaker. Um, Tamika, let me know if the other guys popped in because if not, we're going to keep going with Dr. Um, yeah, I'm good to go. And, and we're just going to roll. Um, but um, I don't know what happened to the black um, male yeah. depression. Yeah, I don't get to talk to, bl I don't get to, talk to black people, so I, I'll be yeah. here. <laughs> you know, we, we have this theme that we have all kinds of people show up at Southern Soul. And there's a theme that people out in the Midwest, they like, y'all, we ain't seen no black folks in a long time. And it's real. I was in Salt Lake City for a summer. They had 0 0.07 black people. Oh, my gosh. It's so yeah. bad. That and when you mm -hmm. like that, if you see two black people together, everybody stare, including the black people. They say, "Look, they were two black people." That's how it is in Salt Lake. So it sounds like Idaho ain't much different. So a last question: We're going to open up. You better. I, I better not. I'm sorry. I, I, I was just going to say I, I better not see a black person walking in a, in a Walmart and and don't wave at me. You better act like you see me. Uh -huh. Like it's it's one of those situations. Like we waving at each other. Hey, hey, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? How long you been here? How long you been here? Like that's kind of the conversation. It's automatic. We're gonna dap each other up. We're gonna ask how how are you living here? Like how are you surviving in this area? What are some tips that you got? Can we hang out sometime? Like those, that's those are some some of the basic conversations I have here anytime I see a black person in this. Now that you mention that story, it's a tangent. But when I was in Utah, it was the first time. You know, you a frat guy, like I'm a frat guy, different frat, right? But the first time I saw mm -hmm. some frat plates, man, I got in my car, chased behind that car, chased down to be like, "What's up, frat brother?" Yeah. Now, I know you had that experience, right? The first time you ran yeah. out there. Yeah, so I, I pledged Alpha Phi Alpha, and and so I was thinking, you know, it was, it was just going to be me in the state, um, but you know, I jumped into the the database and and I saw who was who was active and all that. So I was able to find a couple brothers out here, uh, which was good. Now, no one in my city, um, however, I was able to find folks in like Boise and uh, some 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 of the cities up north. Uh, yeah, represent 06, 06. They, I see, I saw the, oh, I saw the guy. Boy, everywhere. Oh, you know, so. Anyway, anyway, okay, 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 okay. Because <laughs> I know, I, you know, it's all love, but I know you're on another, you, you know, you joined the wrong team. But anyway, um, the point that I'm trying to make is, uh, yeah, I, I feel like, um, anytime I see, yeah, anytime. I see a fellow brother or even a AK, you know, it's it's an exciting moment because even like a local chapter, uh, I pledged out of Portland, Portland State University. And that's what a 10 hour drive from where I live right now. We used to have a chapter out in Salt Lake area, but you know, unfortunately it's not as active. So I don't really have any chapters around. So yeah, I'm definitely excited if I see any Greek that I recognize. Awesome. Awesome. So let's go ahead. Um, let's see here. Um, one last question, because we want to hear about your leading equity center. 
and the work you're doing there, because a good opportunity is that you're always one degree removed. And I love what you said. You said, because I know you do consulting work, but you said, Calvin, most of my work is not yeah. in my home state. Dude, that's crazy, but it's so Ooh. believable. Tell us about Leading Equity Center, why you found it. Tell us about your podcast. Tamika's going to drop in the chat where they can follow you at your podcast and Leading Equity Centers. Tell about Leaders Leading Equity Center, the work you do, and what type of people hire you. So we're at, uh, let's see, I think we just published episode 260-ish, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. I've been doing a show for four years, and we just basically talk, talk about uh, equity um, in, in educational settings. Um, so I've had, you know, I've had the opportunity to, to have some great interviews and meet some, some interesting folks that I probably would never have been able to connect with. So it's just the beauty of virtuality and, and being able to uh, connect with folks remotely via zoom or whatever it is. Uh, and, and so we, like I said, we just typically about 30 minute shows, uh, I come out every Monday and we just talk about, you know, equity related issues. I think this last episode that just came out was uh, on the Bilingual Education Act. And I had Dr. Flores on and him and I just chopped it up and he just talked about the history of the Bilingual Education Act, how that impacts things today, where we are at, uh, the legacy and all these things. The week before that, I believe I had a conversation um, not too long ago on, you know, how to have conversations about racial slurs in school. It was a a white professor that was talking to me about how she's trying to be an anti-racist and anti- um, you know, anti-racist educator and and help her her white children to learn as well and and deal with you know how to explain it the n-word to them and, and why they shouldn't be saying it and it, like all these things these kind of conversations I get to have all the time and I really just I just soak it up and I learn and so as a result you know we started the leading equity center which we do a lot of training so uh, a lot of the training work that we do is centers around again racial equity uh we also do a lot of work on social emotional learning special education i do a lot of keynotes um so this past august i spent a lot of time with a lot of welcome back back to school type of speeches uh motivational type of speeches and things like that so uh, i'm fortunate because you know I do get those opportunities to be on stage. I love being on stage. I'm a storyteller, so I'm I'm just gonna just try to crack jokes and tell stories uh, and relate it to a message. Um, so those are really fun. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy to work with schools. I work with districts. I work with nonprofits. I work with for profits on diversity, equity, inclusion type of uh, topics. Awesome, awesome. And Tamika dropped in the chat where they can follow you on your podcast and also, so. Um, um, Gerald has a question. Gerald, if you don't mind, I think Gerald's a new name. Um, I unmuted um, Jennifer. Jennifer, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm in the car. Sorry. I'm here, okay. though. <laughs> no worries. Jennifer, talk to us. I know you got some questions. For everyone else, this is a good time. We're going to jump into some Q&A with Dr. Dr. Sheldon. And I'll, so, Gerald, um, if you don't mind typing your question, um, sorry, um, we don't recommend I don't recognize you. And since this is such a sensitive topic, we want to make sure that we know who you are. So if you don't mind typing your question, that'll be perfect. Um, Jennifer, go ahead with your question um, and let us know what you got on your mind. Yeah, I just want to thank you so much for, for even, um, you know, having this important topic. And um, Sheldon, thank you so much for this, the very important work that you're doing in the community. I, I just, which is tremendous. It is absolutely tremendous. So the question that I want to ask is, I understand, I was raised by somebody who understands the work that you're doing. Most people are not raised in that kind of environment. My mother is a lifelong educator. So But I feel very similar to the conversation that you're having. So most most kids don't to, to parents who are on the call to say, these are some things you may want to look out for that might be happening in your child's school so that they know what. Awesome. Awesome. You know, so what I hear, Jennifer, you were breaking up a little bit. So I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because I see the direction you're going. And someone else, Lola, put, you know, in the chat, she's talking about the PWI experience. There's been this theme, um, Mm -hmm. Dr. Sheldon, of parents who are intentionally or accidentally, their children end up in these 
all white environments. And we know the history, right? It used to be cool, right? It takes my buddy Ren joking about it. He said, you remember back in the 60s and black folks were sending their kids to school and them kids ever since been trying to get the good fresh water from the all white fountain? You see, it was something in our psyche that the water that came from the all white fountain was much better, right? And that South Carolina Ren story, I give him his credit. And I said, you know, I know a lot of people who think about that only one, but then we joke, we say, don't y'all realize that the ice cold water here at Southern Soul is better than the water at the all white fountain? But that's just my politics. But Dr. Shelton, tell me what you think. You have parents intentionally, whatever, you know what it's like to try to put your children in the best schools. And you talked about public schools yeah. versus private schools. But then all of a sudden parents end up in these situations that they don't yeah. know how to deal with. Like you said, they don't have the background. Jennifer's asking, maybe I'm thinking you have a chapter in your book or something like that, or maybe you have some resources you can share with us for parents who are in these all-white environments and they don't know what to do to su best support their kids. You know, um, that's a good question. You know, when, when I'm, when me and my kid's mom decided that we're going to move to uh, Idaho, we, we were concerned because we, we knew the demographics and we're like, well, how, how are our kids going to be treated? And we, we're trying to weigh out the options. You know, do we want to send our kids to private school? Do we want to send them to public school? And we said, you know what, we're going to send them to a private school. Not only a private school, we're going to send them to a private Christian academy. You know, that, that should be, you know, it's known as the best school in town. And so this is the school that we're going to send them. And because they should have a better educational experience. Um, unfortunately, I, I would say that and I, and I love my kids' school, and I, I know that they're trying. It's just they're just, again, don't have a lot of experience with, with Black kids, and which is different, right? It's different to say, yeah, well, we got kids of color. But when you have specific, like, we start talking about specific challenges or, or needs of our Black students, for example, it's, it's going to be a lot different, especially when there's only five to 10 out of 500, 600 kids. You know, so those those type of things can make a difference. So it, it has been some challenges. Like I said, the main thing that I would recommend for parents who are in these type of situations is to be able to have those conversations with your child when they come home or when they're in the car or you're picking them up for school or whenever they show up at home um, and just being able to say, hey, how was your day? What are some things that happened? And then again, role playing with the child. Uh, these different situations. Um, I, I one of the things that I've told my daughter because one of her biggest challenges. I mean, she has she has nice natural hair, nice little fro going on, just nice curls, everything, and she rocks it like that. She rocks it hard, and so she's telling me, you know, kids are putting trying to put pencils in her hair and they're trying to touch her hair all the time. Like she's dealing with these things, and I I told her I said, listen, you need to be very firm with these kids and say you will not touch my hair anymore. You will not reach out and put pencils in my hair anymore. Like you need to be very firm with these kids. Otherwise they will keep doing these nonsense. Sometimes I tell, you know, grab their hair back, you know, go ahead and pull, pull their hair and tell them do the same thing that they're doing to you. And again, I'm just trying to teach my child how to stand up for herself. I, my daughter understands my son understands. I say, listen, if you get in trouble for some racial issues at school, you will not get in trouble at home. And I just, and that is reinforced. So they know they are allowed. They have been given permission because, you know, I've gone to school. I've talked to the principals. I've, 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 I've done, like, I feel like I've done what I can do. And like, again, I'm not always satisfied with the results that, that come out. And you know what? I'm not going to always be there. A teacher may not always be around. And there's going to be times when my kids need to know how to do stuff on their own time when it's just them and another student and be able to defend themselves. And like I said, if you get in trouble at school, you ain't gonna get in trouble at home. I, I'd rather you stand up for yourself and do your thing uh, and, and, and feel empowered because again, you're just, uh, there's not a lot of representation and I want you to feel empowered. And these are the strategies and tools and tips that I try to give my kids. So again, I know, I know I have that background. And again, this is what I do for a living. I'm always happy to help. If you want to listen to some of the podcast episodes, I'm pretty sure I've touched on a subject you might be interested in. Feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to help because I know what it's like. I understand. Well, you know, Dr. Sheldon, I like that response. I'll tell you why. Because as a dad, one of the major things that I went through when my son was in daycare, and he's in what I call private daycare, all white environment. It was a funny place where if it wasn't white, it was like some Disneyland mix, you know, whatever. So I was like, wait a minute. I think the highfalutin 
you know, because there's always these social structures, right? So you have to be mixed to be a part of the social structure, right? Anyway, there weren't kids with curly hair a part of the social structure. So, you know, my son had curly hair like yours. So one day he comes home and he's like, somebody was making fun of his hair. And I had already thought about it because I already knew I, he had watched Spider-Man, you know, Into the Spider-Verse with Miles Morales a thousand mm-hmm. times. Mm-hmm. I told him a thousand times that your hair is cool like Miles Morales. So I'm waiting. I'm anticipating the day. So he yeah. comes home and he's like, oh, the kids were, you know, teasing my hair. He said, well, he said it's one kid. So I like what you said. And I think it's an ideal, perfect parent tactic in addition to more things because this is a living thing is what I'm taking away from what you're saying. So what you said is you got to talk to these children, right? And when you talk mm-hmm. to them and ask them how they day was, they'll tell you some stuff, but you got to listen. So I'm listening mm-hmm. when he tell me. So then I remember it was something that happened. Maybe he didn't want to go to school the next day because first I was like, okay, you know, and I kind of heard it. And then I, you know, it went through one ear and, and it, I did really didn't digest it. Next morning, he didn't want to go to school. So then I was like, well, why you want to school? And then he started telling me that situation again. And then he told me there was multiple kids who were participating. I was like, oh, multiple kids participating. This ain't just one kid with a bad attitude. Mm. You got multiple kids. So I go to the school. I talk to the director. And the director is a sister. But, you know, she was from New York somewhere. And she married some other people who didn't look like her. So, you know, at first I didn't know what to expect from her. What I got was I was surprised. I got instant engagement. She went upstairs, talked to that teacher instantly. By the end of the day, we had an apology. We had an action plan. We had all of the kids in front of the classroom where they were apologizing and they were understanding the things that they will not, you know, pick on other kids for, you know, look, skin, clothing, hair, Mm -hmm. you know. And some people like, were you happy with that? I'm like, yeah, I was happy with that. You know, they're like, well, I would have been happy with something else. I'm like, well, that's your position. My position is my son was more soft-spoken and they didn't expect him to be a communicator. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get him talking early. There's other people that didn't think he, they thought I was pushing him. I'm like, no, the boy got the gift. My daddy talked, you know, I talked, so I knew. And that teacher that didn't look, it was the first teacher he had that didn't look like him to some extent. And I could tell when I dropped him off, she would kind of ignore him a little bit. She didn't really pull him into the circle. But when he told me that story, and I listened to it, and I got the second part of the story the next day, is that's when I engage. And I share that story about the type of attention, right, I think you're alluding to. And I don't think there's a silver bullet, but what I see you alluding to is that active engagement. Yeah, it, exactly. And, and the thing about it is here's a piece that I, I, I used to forget to do uh, in these type of situations is, okay, so let's say a child is made fun of because of their hair or style or it's weird or whatever. Uh, and so what happens is the teacher addresses the situation and they address the, per- the perpetrators, right? They say, oh, just shouldn't say that about him. Uh, that's not a, a, a nice thing to say. And here's why, you know, we're bullying, you know, the policies come out. But what happens is that child that was made fun of, we don't always go back to that child and reinforce the, the self-affirmations that need to happen. You know what, Johnny? I'm sorry that those kids said that about your hair. Listen to me. Your hair is beautiful. Your hair is nice. It's I wish I had. Like, if we just go back to those individuals that were being made fun of and let them, like, let them know, listen, your skin is awesome color. So what? Your skin is dark. Your skin is beautiful, right? Those kids don't know what they're talking about. Uh, your hair looks awesome. It looks beautiful. Kids need to hear this from their teachers. We look up to our educators, you know, they're adults and we're little ones. And and how great is it to be able to have, to know that your teacher has your back? Not just that they're going to deal with your issue and, and, and go talk to those students or, you know, discipline wherever they need to discipline them, but they're also going to come back to you and let you know, no, this, these people were wrong. And, and I want you to feel empowered. I want you to, to, to love yourself. We see so many kids these days committing suicide, going and getting into opioids and doing all these different things because they're not getting that reinforcement that that letting they're not having people come to them and tell them how worthy they are and, and, and educating them and just reminding them of those things. And then what happens to these kids just keep making fun of them. So, oh, so they'll just they'll just stop making fun of the, the child when when the teacher's not around. Oh, you're a snitch. 
And so now you got to deal with that part too, right? So all these different things that children have to have to deal with. And just as teachers, there's little things. And even in parents, there's little things that we can do to just let the kids know, listen, so what about what those kids are saying? They don't know what they're talking about. I tell my children those things all the time. No, you have awesome hair. So what? So what would they have to say? They just mad because they don't have hair like yours. Awesome. Awesome. Well, people, if you have any questions in the chat, we're going to wrap up with Dr. Shelton. Dr. Shelton, thank you so much for dropping down and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, brother, for doing what you do. You know, I just think it's so precious, right, that representation matters, but not only representation matters, but we are not at the place anymore where we shave our heads, we look like Michael Jordan because Mm -hmm. we want to fit in, right? Mm -hmm. And in case you guys want to really, really get a summary of what happens when we don't pay attention to these things, because at Southern Soul, we often talked about the problem. We also talk about the solution. Check this out. A new episode that just published um, at southernsoulpodcast.com is an sh- episode uh, we did last month. And we have two adults who grew up in all white environments. And if you were here and you saw the show with Dr. Chris and the young lawyer, you may have missed it. But both of those speakers had something in common. They grew up in all white environments. Go back and listen to that show. Thank you for joining us at Southern Soul Livestream Talk Show. Join us weekly at soullivestream.com. If you're joining us live, we'll take a quick music break and then come back for a discussion with the audience.